coming up in this episode. When you look at really, really successful people or people that have made a shit ton of money, they have made it because they have a great deal of emotional intelligence. Yep. So you can be the cleverest person in the world, but unless you can tell good stories, unless you understand the people that you are speaking, then most things will not proceed to the next yep. level. Which is why I, I don't like this rhetoric against straight white anyone, right? Let alone yeah. Or, 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 or queer black anyone or whatever. I mean, you're just, you're doing the same thing. You've just repackaged yeah. it. It's racism, but it's rebranded. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's lunacy to me. Building your network is really, really important mm. yeah. um, because actually all that support that you need will, you know, seek out people that have been there, done it, wore the t-shirt. Mm. Um, it's got holes in it because they've had it that long. Like, you know, that, yeah. those type yeah. of people that can, can really help you. The Founders Unplugged podcast, hosted by Greg McCallum. Raw, unedited conversations with entrepreneurs and startup founders. Good. Sorry, I'm just uh, doing all of the, the button clicking and the, there we go. Done. Um, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> As you probably noticed, I, we're recording already. We just go straight into it. There's no, uh, we, we, you know, we don't um, rest on ceremony, um, including the messy hair and everything. So it's Wow. Not, not even done my vocal warm ups. Oh, really? Oh, no. <laughs> We, we can do that now if you want. I'd be curious to see what that's like. <laughs> it's, not, it's just uh, chatting mins for like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so tell me, how have, how have you been since we last spoke? You well? Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. As a startup founder, everything just seems to blur into, into one. So I normally start calls with various adv advisors as, Oh, I've not really done anything. And then by the end of the call, I'm like, oh, I've done this, 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 yeah, this, yeah, and this. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, all, all good. I'm glad the sunshine's finally decided to to join us here in the UK. I was beginning to think it was a bit of a uh, Brexit kind <laughs> of. Uh, well, you know. It went. It went with Brexit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the yeah. rest of Europe have had like you know bushfires and and all sorts of temperatures, and we've had a miserable summer. Um, but it's yeah. been pretty hit and miss, isn't it? I'm seeing it now as like limited edition summer, where it's like clearly you can take like the air is feeling a bit wintry. You can kind of feel it, and it's like, ah, oh, like, well, we'll make the most of it, you know. Uh, yeah. But the the pool is going away tomorrow because I'm not trusting the rest of the week. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Putting putting that away, the uh, the paddling pool. But um, but look, uh, th there is a there is some semblance of um of structure to this by the way it might not appear like there is but there is and the the first bit is like to get it out of the way so we can get into it is um tell me about you we'll tell everyone that's listening who you are um and a bit about your business and that's uh yeah give yourself a, a lovely introduction and then we can go from there uh, okay so uh hi everyone that's listening uh my name is emma louise fizari i am the founder of in-house health and if i was doing my elevator pitch to you i would be saying uh what we do is implement data informed workplace health and well-being solutions and we predominantly work with digital tech organizations and enable them to make a measurable impact on their people performance and profits and in english what that means is i help digital tech businesses get to the root cause of problems um, rather than the fluffy shite that they tend to do around well-being so i think uh, it is my job um and my aim to put a hard edge onto we workplace well-being because it is seen as this fluffy um untangible thing when actually um it can be measured it can be managed mm -hmm. and it can be done properly um and i suppose i'm shifting that from traditional focus on individual employees as if they're the problem and i'm taking that problem to leadership teams and to um organizations because actually they're the root cause of the problem and until they create really good um, working environments, uh, safe environments, then all the other money they are spending on well-being initiatives and uh, things, mm. then they may as well just get, you know, go all Joe Lysa and burn that, burn their money and uh, not see any benefits from it because they are tick bo boxing, basically. 
Yeah, get rid of the ping pong table. There's better things to spend money on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that it's measured, and and by the way, thank you for the introduction. You mentioned that, that you know there are better ways of measuring it. What are those better ways of measuring this kind of thing? Well, I think actually just measure measuring it in the first place because right. a lot of businesses do not measure. So when you look at how organisations are run. Um, they will measure all areas of the business, but when it comes to employee well-being, um, they are not measuring things. And when I talk about measurements, you know, businesses say, oh, yeah, we do engagement surveys, we do satisfaction surveys, and they are, for me, closely linked to benefits, and benefits are not employee well-being. Well-being is not something that you do, it's an outcome of what you do. Right. And when I'm talking about measuring, we measure employee health data. So we're looking at the, the impact that work has on people's health and well-being. Because I'm talking about work-related ill health here. So, mm. um, Well, both physical and mental. Physical, physical. mental, emotional, um, right. psychological, financial, cultural. Mm. Um, so looking at it holistically, because I think you find you know that in all areas of the world there's trends and yeah. you probably remember you know oh, I don't know <laughs> I, f I feel old but you know 10 years ago the focus was on um smoking um mm. and we've seen those like horrible sausagey fat kind of adverts on the telly that there's a shift to heart disease and we see people like Vinnie Jones doing staying alive staying alive mm. you know the the kind of Bee Gees adverts and at the minute the folk focuses on uh, mainly on mental mental ill health mm. and for me it's important that we look at health and well-being hol holistically and because it's the whole chicken and the egg like you know is people are people's mental health impacted by their physical health or their financial health or their emotional or is it the other way around mm. so we always have to look at the, the big picture but what is missing when we're looking at measurements is what is the organization doing to mitigate the risks of poor employee well-being so how are they looking at um their policies in place that they have in place um how are they ensuring that people have the right training and skills to do the job um the relationships you know do have do people have any emotional intelligence that are in management positions and um, mm -hmm. people tend to get promoted because they are um you know they're good at the job but doesn't mean that they should be anywhere near other humans <laughs> uh, a lot a lot of the time um yeah I, I know i know a few people like that i'm yeah. one of them <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, i think like what what's missing and what should be measured are the and directly linked is the health and well-being of your people and the outcomes of your business mm -hmm. so how does employee health and well-being relate to project delivery times how does it relate to your client retention how mm -hmm. does it relate to other um you know your head count <laughs> like and your bottom line profit so all these things need to be linked um, yeah. because they are intrinsically linked with e with each other so i think when i'm talking about measurements my focus is I, I, i'm not going to say i don't care about the employees that's that's in, that is not true at all but my focus is on the business and what they can do mm -hmm. to make sure that the business is healthy that the business is thriving um, and that it's creating a good uh well-being culture because when all those things are are good everything else will take care of itself mm -hmm. and it starts at the top right because mm -hmm. so you know for someone who works myself with a lot of startups and have done for a very long time the problem with within the world of startups is there's an overbearing sense of dread continuously in the air <laughs> because of you know the startup world is a very uncertain one right you know you're not talking yeah. about companies that necessarily are making an enormous amount of money right? you know necessarily in profit a lot of it at least it used to be thankfully it's changing slightly is about you know how many investors can you get on your cap table and like mm. how much investor money can you get and when are we you know raising our next round and all that kind of thing so the anxiety is literally starting from the top 
where mm. you know the, the founders are quite often the ones who are you know anxious about the fact whether or not they're going to have a job in six months time so you know naturally that's going to filter down are you are you seeing that like that's a hypothesis from me like are you are you seeing that that that's quite often the case with like when you say focus on the business is that why is it quite often rooted in kind of the, the, the fundamentally how the, the, the management team is run the executive team is run and that sort of trickles down yeah i think <laughs> until i came into tech myself i think kind of what, what i still f almost feel like an imposter an outsider and when i look mm. into the the tech culture it's a very weird little bubble that everyone te tends to live in you know like you talking there about raising and the next raise and, and going as if it's a badge of honor yeah. i mean even like with a logical business head on i'm like this business has been going 10 years and they've not like made a profit like why you keep tell me about it <laughs> like, yeah it doesn't yeah. make sense to me and it, yeah. it's it's really strange mentality and you know founder burnout is is rife um mm -hmm. i think it is kind of uh survival of the of the fittest and i know lots of people that have burnt out that have had long-term impacts on on their health and mm -hmm. you know it's it's like it's not my job to to kind of point fig fingers at business leaders and and startup founders and say oh you know you're shit you're horrible like that's not that's nobody's yeah. intention and but i think having it, it's counterintuitive i think a lot of the things that I, I advise are counterintuitive you know when you tell people to rest they're like mm -hmm. no i've got like 50 th things a day on my to-do list i can't rest but actually when you take a step back when you um, reflect when you process things actually it gives you more capacity to mm. to be more productive um but yeah i mean individuals and, and founders are a kind of their own beast and <laughs> yeah. I, I think really if i was to give any kind of advice to them it's like just remember the basics eat well get some exercise in and um and get some good good quality sleep and that those are the first things that go out the window when you're building a business yeah and it is hard and you know you are doing um you know you you are doing in excess of 60 80 hours a week sometimes um, yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's very much this case of do as i say don't do as i do right yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but, Which, but yeah. But the thing is, there's a lot of founders out there that expect their their employees to to work just as hard as them, which is which is I think very unrealistic. But um, but yeah, you mentioned there about like how businesses can be going ten years and like not making any money. It's funny because the vast majority of the advice I seem to be giving businesses on the commercial side of things these days is is bring it back to basics. The the, the, yeah. the world is changing, things are shifting, like investments drying up. That there's a recession yeah. on the way like you you need to figure out how to make your business profitable before anything else and trust me you'll thank me for it because of all the reasons you just mentioned like that the, the burnout and everything and the stress associated with it if you yeah. can build a business that's just like making more money than it's spending which yeah. for me is like business economics 101 from the very beginning then suddenly you don't have anywhere near as many stresses <laughs> as you used to you still have plenty but they're slightly different and you're not relying and, and you're not sort of beholden to a lot of people you don't really know you know uh, and well, potentially going to let them down yeah. as well you know i mean this is the thing because actually you then become accountable to other people yeah. who can just pull the rug from under you anytime they want really depending on their uh, equity share which is exactly and, what's happened yeah right, in the last few years you know with these companies failing where people have just said you know you know how we committed x amount of money to you over the next however many years yeah we're not doing that now you know yeah. and it's and it's kind of like when you start a business um, and you build something it's like i don't know do you do you want that accountability to like in a way like you need accountability sometimes to make mm. you focus to yeah. like you know um put targets in place to to achieve things but when you give a portion of that away and you're accountable to other mm. people that i suppose that kind of takes the it's very privileged but you know takes that passion element about and why you started your business in in the first place Can do. it just yeah. kind of runs away from you and it's yeah. like sometimes i think you have to like refocus and think well is this what i'm building because i can't like i kind of feel like from my point of view i've been pigeonholed into this 
building SaaS products. And right. I'm like, oh, yeah, SaaS, yeah, SaaS, like all this, you know, like really wanky terms that people give to in, in this in this, in this tech world. And I'm thinking about it and I'm just like, but that is not, you know, I am not a software as a service company. Mm. I I might be um, service as a software, <laughs> as, I, as, I, as I'd re redefined it. Yeah. But really, I'm building a solid business that has a subscription model mm. with monthly and annual recurring revenue. And it's kind of like, why are investors so pigeonholed into this SaaS model? They are they're missing out on opportunities mm. for businesses that are going to be, you know, um, successful because yep. and and people are being pigeonholed into building something that they don't really want to build mm -hmm. so actually i've spent a lot of this year focusing on investment which is a full-time job in its in yes. itself yeah and i've just taken a step back and like like you were just saying now i'm like okay do you know what second half of the year well actually is less l much less than that now but actually right let's look at the funnel let's look at mm. um, who we've got in there and and let's focus on actually getting the paid proof of concept let's focus on our customers on the mission and vision of why we set the business up and start delivering on that rather than, and it is i kind of feel it'd be like a boss or like a relationship or a baby when you're not expecting it they just come along mm -hmm. so once you're doing the good things and people are watching what you're doing if you if you're building visibly and raising your profile whilst you're doing it then i think you know that'll just take care of it care care of itself but go yeah. back to why i'm building in the first place which is to help businesses um i'd like to say thrive but in these challenging times just survive at the yeah. yeah boosting their their profits by helping their people so i remember that you know from when we first spoke to, to now again i'm reminded by the fact that there's so many similarities in the way that we approach things um you know from from sort of the structure of our uh, of our plans, you know, and, and wanting to sort of help a, a broad spectrum of people, and and yeah, and even to sort of the, the refocus element of like, okay, stop, you know, the, the focus is drifting from the main reason why I started this company. I went through the same thing recently too. You know, it's 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 interesting how how many similarities there are there between what we do. Like that, that's got to be the focus. And what you said there about you know, if, as you do this somewhat publicly and you just put it out there, then I think that can in some ways take care of itself like you know yeah. that that not only is that very sensible in this day and age for you know building a sort of a, a content marketing strategy somewhat for, for for bringing people into your funnel but also um you know for, for yeah potential future investment for you know for, for for continuous growth for all these things it's just a more organic way of doing things i think you know that, that that's the future of the way companies should be should be built is is on community and, and i'm you know giving that advice time and time again focus on community first because of you know the more people you rally around your cause as long as your cause is and, and your vision is very clear which it should be then then those things usually snowball and, and sort of take care of themselves and then hopefully you don't need to go and see founders as, or uh, investors or at least not as much but um so yeah th that resonates with me but um yeah but i wanted to touch again on, on something you meant uh, some of the things you were talking about before though because of like it's really super interesting the work that you do so so, you know what you mentioned a couple of mistakes that you see a lot of companies make you know from from sort of not having a process in place to being able to get uh to, to get feedback and to really sort of get data points on how things are correlated and things like that. but what are some other sort of more common mistakes you're seeing aside from like you know just buying a, a couple of tins of beer and and and, and, a, and a ping pong table and thinking that they've they've solved the problem yeah i mean well i think i think really this you know washing everyone's washing i wrote that in one of my newsletters a while back you know everyone's washing sports washing um you know all these these terms so we do have well-being washing where right. businesses are doing all all this tick boxy stuff yeah and I, ju I just think i just keep going back to it it's the focus on individuals mm. um individual employees as if they are the problem and you know this isn't of course, people are going to have external issues with the health and well-being, you know, financially, um, mentally, physically. There's lots, you know, in the UK, uh, there's lots of people with long term health conditions. We're seeing um, long term COVID problems. There's, there's, there's all sorts of, of issues that people have that aren't related to their work. Mm. Um, but it, it is just the focus on 
individuals rather than taking the responsibility as an employer to create good operational frameworks ar around well-being and I suppose engaging people in that but then when I say that because you know I often contradict myself <laughs> um, but when I say that you know you don't know what you don't know mm. and as individuals when an employer says like what can we do to help you it, it, I suppose it's that psych psychological element most people think that they have an idea of what it is mm. but that's normally surface level you need to scratch way below that mm. and, it, and that's kind of for me where how so we collect our health data through face-to-face -face employee health checks and it's there's a whole element around you know if you put shit data and you get you know shit uh information uh shit in shit back, out. Back yeah. out yeah yeah so there's lots of companies collecting health data through surveys through self-reporting and for me how we collect the data first of all giving an individual 45 minutes with a healthcare professional um and the opportunity to talk about themselves and their own challenges and mm. um, have the opportunity to get that support that is a health benefit in itself mm. but how we collect the data means that the information we are collecting is more accurate and more relevant which means the support that we put in place is actually going to help the people that need mm. that support and it's more specific than, to the needs yeah. of the people within that company as opposed to sort of having a blanket approach that you just sort of move over to each company you work with right and so yeah. it's a lot more tailored in that respect. yeah so yeah so the education and train training is tailored to the key problem areas yeah for a workforce um rather than something that's off the shelf and uh, i'm working with some larger enterprise businesses at the minute but we're working on a department because the needs of different departments within a large organization are very mm. different. Yeah. You know, you might have, you know, your dev team is going to be very different to your sales team mm. in mm. the day to their day to day jobs. Um, so the environment that they work in, but the pressures are different. Um, their lifestyles are very different. Mm. Their personalities are, are very different. So, so um, even the way that they would interact with, with the way that you conduct, your your side of things would be very different so you might have to change tact in fact in yeah. order to try and extract this information the information you need presumably right yeah yeah and it's it's all around motivational interviewing techniques mm. that are um and good communication and listening mm. so i will do a health check and at the start i collect a lot of data on existing long-term conditions have you told your employer about this getting a feel for the culture and um so for example like they'll be like no 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 and then we get to the mental health assessment so we're looking at anxiety and depression and then we'll have a chat and then people will be like oh uh yeah, I was on uh, antidepressants and such and such, and I was like, "Hang on a minute!" Like when we had, when I first asked you, mm. like you didn't you said, "Oh, well, I forgot," or you know, that's what people say. But it's this whole building relationships and people mm. trusting you as a healthcare professional that what they are telling you is confidential as well. And I think that's really important as a a third party provider of mm. health and well being is that you are not employed by that organization which is why i think hr tends to fall down a lot their job is yeah. to be they are basically legal in compliance for a business so they don't yeah. end up in employment employment tribunals yeah i mean um, hr is I, I agree mostly with the uh what's his name the boss from the office when he talks about hr being predominantly useless um but it's especially useless in the startup world because it, you know like i said before everyone is quite anxious about potentially losing their job it's very unlikely in the startup world people are actually going to speak their minds, which is another yeah. thing that I talk about a lot with my clients. It's like people aren't going to tell you if you're taking the wrong commercial approach. Even the people you've hired to tell you aren't going to tell you if they disagree with you because they, they're too scared to lose their job. And yeah. it's, I suppose it's a very similar thing here. Like people yeah. are very, going to be terrified to reveal maybe too much about what they're going through in the, in the sense that they might jeopardize the job. They might not be given the same sort of level of 
you know projects they've been getting before and responsibility like they're, they're, they must be quite terrified about that right yeah and it, and it works and it works both ways so you know if you're about to you know uh, fire someone because they've got poor performance mm. and you haven't looked at or had a conversation around what might be contributing to be that like you know yeah lo lots of people are shit at the job that, that's yeah. you know that is a that is a given but you know if someone um has young children at home they have a parent that um has cancer you know like there's all sorts going on in people's lives and if you mm. don't have those conversations um as an as a manager as a, a leader within a business then you are on a sticky wicket but then employees have a responsibility as well to put their hands up and say i'm struggling i need more support here mm. um, to protect themselves as, as well but you've got to create an environment where that that is something that people feel like they can do and that's yes. a lot of the time the problem isn't it but yeah but, but where's the line in all of this and i suppose you must get asked this a fair amount but where is the line because the responsibility of the employer to ensure the well-being of its employees must end somewhere and the responsibility of the individual must start somewhere and vice versa right so yeah. how is that line defined because like you know like you just pointed out some people are just shit some people yeah. just should should be fired they should be let go yeah. but everyone even in those situations could probably point to something in their life to blame as to why their performance isn't yeah. there but when is that not good enough you know and 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 where and where and where in all of the what you do like you know you're going through the trouble of interviewing let's say a company hires you go through the trouble of interviewing everyone and really trying to get a good picture of of, of the health and well-being and everything of their employees but like, again like where's the line there like you know ultimately isn't it individuals responsibility to make sure that they're healthy to make sure that they're prepared for work that they're going in and ready to do the job oh 100 percent. and i think um that line continues to to be blurred so going back mm. to hr so this is where hr come in and this is where process is really important mm. and that a fair uh, process is followed at all points in a business um when you are looking at performance etc of course there are legal um responsibilities for employers that they have to follow in terms of um health and safety at work and that does incorporate so it's health safety and welfare and that does incorporate making sure that people are psychologically safe so that trust and that tends to be what's missing from a lot of organization that that toxic culture where mm -hmm. people can't be open i don't want to say you know people can't come to work as their authentic self i think the majority of people have um, an at-home person and an at-work person. I don't think mm. anyone's th always the same in different si social situations. So, but where people feel that they can, um, where they have a voice, where they feel listened to, and there's no retribution um, from that. But definitely, you know, well-being is an individual's responsibility. But again, going back to what I'm trying to create within house health is the it's the work related ill health so mm. as an employer if that person um is struggling in an area and they've not had any training or education in that we see it all the time in startups where mm. you know yeah. you, you get hired uh, in a role and then two weeks later you've got a completely different job mm. and then six weeks later you're doing something completely different mm. and somebody leaves because they can't handle the the pressure of that fast-paced always on environment in tech and then you're doing their job as well so mm. all of a sudden you're switching between things you you know a lot of startups are making think things up as they go, go along to a degree but when that person is underperforming and as an employer you're causing them work-related stress because you've not given them the right skills or the training to do that job that's the response that's the employer's responsibility mm. the, see, I, see, I see it from both sides because I've, yeah. I've seen that time and time again but equally I've seen that that in employees ability to say no to things is is not there as much as it should be and i think i i i, I think one of the bit, best bits of advice or, or i think one of the best bits of the most common bits of advice i give to people in general is yeah. to learn how to say no more to, you know say no i'm not comfortable doing that no i've got enough on my plate no i'm not confident in doing that and that's the thing that 
again, I suppose you could argue, well, it's also the employer's fault for not, you know, creating an environment where they feel comfortable to say no. But at the same time, it could also be just purely out of passion. Everyone's very passionate about wanting to get the thing going ahead. No one yeah. wants to say no to anything because they just want to get it over the line. They just want to do it. Yeah. So, you know, this is what I mean. Where's the line? It's really blurry. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, and I think, especially when you are a uh, junior member of staff or you are new into a business mm. saying no is really difficult but there are ways that you can reframe no oh yeah yeah, um, yeah. yeah totally. so you know like uh can you just do this yeah of course i can but you've also asked me to do this so what is it you would like me to do first what yeah. do you what, want what is to it you prioritize? want to be prioritized yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. The, there's uh because i do some um training with some young digital marketing students hmm. and you know around creating healthy boundaries and stuff and that this is the common thing like well i'm new in i don't want to look like i'm not keen by yeah. by saying no and it's like you know i i get that but actually as an employer you should be able to respect people's boundaries as well yeah. and you know it's not it's not my job to go into a business and say like oh all these people are overworked you have to you know everyone needs to work three days a week four hours a day and you know it's fine yeah. you it's, probably wouldn't last very long if you were going around saying that. no 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 i would definitely would not have any, yeah. any work but you know you have to you have to be a realist in all yeah. this and you know i think it, especially in the younger generations there is a change in like la language is really important mm. so people will say oh, oh i'm so stressed or oh i'm i'm, I'm depressed or, you know like people are using language that isn't fitting for yeah. their feelings and it you know it's i shouldn't really you know i'm not saying that i don't believe what people say no i know what you mean it's, it's my, over, there are terms that are being overused yes um, across the board for a, a whole range of very extreme feelings or thoughts yeah but actually aren't appropriate for that it's like okay you're a little bit overwhelmed yeah but well, you're saying you're, you're stressed like yeah you need well, to my, da my daughter who's 19 she'll come in from work and i'll say oh how is work and she's like oh it's so stressful Mm. and I was like oh like oh what's what's happened and then she'll tell me something and I'm like well that sounds like work <laughs> yeah I was just like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. just get used to it kid yeah exactly <laughs> it's like there's a certain element of like suck it up and like yeah but it's really interesting you brought up this this idea of language and communication because of I yeah. think the vast majority of problems within a business can be brought just like any relationships can be boiled down to communication and like that that one you mentioned about the advice you'd give to you know how to say no effectively i think it's a, a really good case for why and i'm a huge advocate advocate for this people should be um doing everything they can to be as skillful in the art of communication as possible written and verbal like and, and non-verbal even yeah. because it's so incredibly important for the for the success of uh you know people working together effectively uh you know on, on a mi micro level and a macro level and like that that's 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 amazing that you pointed that out is is that something that you like you said you do you do some sort of coaching to, in that degree is that is that part of this sort of operational stuff that you do as well give some sort of guidance on uh, as a whole to a company of how to be more effective communicators to ensure yeah. that these kinds of misalignments don't occur well when you look at most problems it all comes down to communication yeah. lack of poor, poor communication but i think something that is we're seeing more, more and more people talk about it but it's it's not quite gone to the next step where it's fully embedded into organizations is a lot of the soft skills that are missing and yeah. i have i have redefined them as success skills um because i don't like mm -hmm. the term soft I, it's really bizarre like you know um soft skills well actually the fundamental skills to be in mm -hmm. um, when when you look at when you look at really really successful people or people that are, you know de de depends on your definition of success or people that have made a shit ton of money they mm -hmm. have made it because they have had they might not have been educated but they have a great deal of emotional intelligence yeah, yeah and so you can be the cleverest person in the world but unless you can tell good stories unless you understand the people that you are speaking to and have that mm. self-awareness then most things will not really pr proceed to the next yeah. level if you are enjoying this episode please subscribe
like and share your thoughts in the comments. Likeability and charisma are hugely underrated yeah. in terms of skills and, and the ability to tell a story as well yeah. is an, another hugely underrated skill. One of the things yeah. that I advise a lot of people who are looking to get serious about, whether that's people wanting to get into sales, for example, for the first time or things like that, I say go and read books. Don't read fucking sales books or business books. Read books about screenwriting read books around story um, creation and stuff, actually some of the most useful things in there because if it teach, and or like go and um, uh, teach yourself public speaking, like get comfortable speaking in front of people. Like, I think those skills are hugely underrated. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So when, when we're looking at leadership teams, when we're looking at uh, team leads, mm. things like um, emotional intelligence, building that self-awareness, resilience mm. because i don't want to again so when i was talking about my daughter and that stress what i was saying to her is that's not stress it's pressure and pressure yeah. is normal and we need pressure a lot of the time to be able to help us to perform mm. but it's how do you handle that how do you learn from your experiences to build resilience mm. um so i think a huge people are talking a lot more about soft skills success skills but actually they need to be embedded at, at the heart and they are definitely the, the skills so they are things that can be uh, taught and they're things that can be learned there's no point saying oh yeah I'm just like you know um I just tell it straight how it is regardless of you know people's personality or how they they take feed, feedback on board and I think when we look specifically at tech self-awareness and communication is really important because there is also a high proportion of neurodivergent thinking mm. and to clearly communicate and for people to understand your messaging it's not a one-size-fits-all so you will have to say it in different ways and different methods and different channels mm. different people to bring everyone on your your journey with you through throughout business so yeah it's a uh, you also have a lot of pro cross cultural communication within tech businesses because quite often, you know, dev teams, uh, especially, uh, at least the vast majority, it seems to be in dev teams, are usually overseas. So you yeah. have a lot of this this cross cultural um, thing. But it, but but also, like, it's interesting because um, you're right. There's not a one size fits all. But I also am a big advocate for having something of an internal dictionary. Um, and this is something I've worked on with a few companies where, you know, you have essentially a, a, an area where you have a set of agreed predefined terms. And this, this was more from a commercial point of view than anything else, but it has a, a serious knock on effect uh, culturally, too, and, and, well, and well-being wise, too, where, you know, you can have different teams all using different terms, but meaning the same thing. And yeah. the mess that it causes, especially with organizations I work with, like I said, that are cross-cultural and, you know, language barriers and all that, is like, guys, you need to just agree on what the terms are for these things, like, especially when it talks about a product. Like, you'll have the sales guys explaining one feature this way, and then you'll have the dev team talking about that feature this way, and then you have the CEO talking about this way and marketing talking about this way. And then meetings would be a mess because they'd be spending half of the meeting trying to figure out what the fuck everyone's talking about. And say, like, oh, you were talking about this feature. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. We just spent half an hour talking about that. And you know, you know what I mean? So like a lot of it's like, guys, come on, just sit down and agree on this stuff. But yeah. like you said, it's because they're working, you know, from day one, usually at such a pace, not what, you know, and figuring out as they go, like, and everyone's sort of building stuff in silo sometimes coming yeah. up with their own little cultures as teams grow. It's a very dangerous thing. And, you know? and th this is the point around well-being, around business in general. Mm. Nothing is, nothing is, um, static everything is yeah. always changing so it's yeah. not oh we've done that file it away put it in a drawer it's like always a working process and it always needs revisiting it always needs working on mm. and i think a real struggle that i see as well is like for the first time we have four generations um of people in the workforce mm. working together and that is challenging as an employer to be able to manage the expectations and the the culture of each generation within the workplace and what they expect from an employer and going back to when you were saying about uh whose responsibility is it well f f firstly uh, for me well-being is not a hr is not hr's responsibility it is everyone's 
responsibility and mm. I think the buck gets passed to, to HR all the time. But when I'm looking at the younger generation coming in, I, I see it a lot in education where parents are passing responsibilities on to teachers because mm. they're busy, because, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, oh, it's teacher's job to t toilet my, my child in nursery or, mm. you know, to use learn to use a knife and fork. All these things were coming yeah, out. Well, those parents are assholes. So, <laughs> yeah. so <it> coming <laughs> out during COVID. But there yeah. is definitely a lot of helicopter parenting going on. And that is having a knock on effect on um, the younger generations we're seeing in the workforce mm. because they haven't learned resilience they haven't learned to be resilient yet because mm. they've not been allowed to make mistakes they've not been allowed to have accidents fall over eat a bit of dirt like the, the parents are literally over the top of them all the time and and kind of keeping them in this cotton wool ball so when it comes to the workforce there mm. is a lack of resiliency within that cohort of people and i is think that that's a new thing though because like a lot of people talk about that, about young people, how, you know, they're, they're sort of more entitled, that they're, they're not as resilient and all that. Is that really new? Because, I mean, that's the point of being young, isn't it? Is to be a bit, you know, useless and to not really understand the way that the world works. And that's why you get your first job. It just so happens that these days, more and more now, the first job is in a tech startup or in a startup yeah. of sorts in the office, as opposed to before, like when I was a teenager, my first job was working in a in a, in a restaurant. It was stacking shelves in a, in, a, in a grocery store. It was doing a paper round, like those kinds of things, yeah. where you learn very quickly about resilience and about but that the, sort of stuff. But so, the, the parents, a lot of parents are taking that away from the children. Oh, it's too it's too dark in the morning for you to have a paper round. That's dangerous. Yeah. So you can't have that. You can't go outside and play on the street with you know with your friends because you might get abducted. Like mm. you know, it sounds sounds extreme, but it is what goes on. So yeah, those skills like there's definitely some bubble wrapping yeah. going on. But I'm not when, I'm not sure if it's like the entire generation is going through that. But uh, my, my, my point my point is more just like. If if we then put the responsibility onto startups, let's say, yeah. to almost continue that, and and uh, you know, and and to, to cater to the well-being and the needs of every individual to an extent, well, then aren't we taking away the opportunity to learn resilience to a degree if we go too far with that? Like that, isn't there some element of just being like, look, no one owes you any form of happiness. It's up to you to make your own form of happiness and yeah. make make what you will of this job. The job's hard, the job's demanding. You work harder. If you put in more hours, you can get more out of it, but it's gonna be harder. Like, isn't there yeah. some lesson there? Like in the same way that doing a paper round, if I was to, you know, go out in the, the rain, in the snow, I'm gonna make more money. Like no one was sent worried about my well-being. Like, oh, you might catch a cold, health and safety regulation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but so if they're missing that, then aren't we doing people a disservice with that sort of with the the, the lack of those traits by by further potentially wrapping them up in cotton, cotton wool? Um, I I think the problem is when they come into that environment, they don't last very long, mm. um, and they they burn out much quicker, or they're like, oh, this just is, isn't for me. But mm. then in in the same respect, you can see people who have worked in um, larger organisations that go into startup world and fail completely as well. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, a completely, yeah. It's, it, is a, it is its own breed in terms of environment and mm. dedication. and. Um, but it also depends on the stage, right? Because I think a lot of people, like, there are some businesses out there that call themselves startups. They've been going for 10 years. <laughs> you're not you're not a fucking startup but and people talk about you know the startup culture i think it's really only the first couple of years of, of a business's yeah. life that, that it is like that craziness but once there's a bit of stability there it's just an office job right yeah. like, and we've just repainted it to be this new thing and if you can't stand an office job well then fine but an, off, an office job it's a job is a job like you yeah. know like, we make yeah. it out like it's this very mystical thing but essentially it's just that's all it is right yeah yeah, I, I, th I think so. Yeah, it's yeah. We just like to label ev everything and make it sound exciting. Yeah, like I was saying, that sounds like, cool. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. But like I'd said, we'd said in the beginning, you know, like you've got businesses that have been going ten years and they're mm. they're still a startup and they've not made any profit, and it's just like yeah, yeah. Well, 
you know, you're just clinging you're not a startup, you're just a, start yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not, you're not a startup, you're just a shit business. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but, but back to my question, though, I mean, like, don't, don't you agree that there's, or, or maybe you don't agree that there's, you know, that responsibility, if, we, if we're just letting people come in, if, let's say they don't quit, like, to your point, they don't like, yeah. just leave, move on, aren't we just doing them a disservice by, by, by focusing so much on employee um, health and well-being. I'm not saying we're focus on it too much or not. I don't know. Yeah. I don't, you know, is the honest answer. I, I don't know. But if let's say we do, if let's say they go into a company that's you know been going for three or four years now, fairly well established, and they've got a you know you and a lot of other uh, focus going on for this kind of thing. Me as like a young person going in, just fresh out of college or university, no previous experience, no ability to be resilient or, you know, not a huge amount of self-awareness, maybe not a very good communicator and things yeah. like that. Isn't that a huge disservice to walk into an environment like that, where I'm, that is somewhat being identified as, as something that's now acceptable? It's like, OK, well, I'll, you know, continue to be like that. We'll support you. We'll do what we can to help you. No, because I, I think that so we're talking here about culture i think rather than rather than well-being specifically mm. so it is going back to whose responsibility it, is it yeah so it's an em, employer's responsibility to ensure that they do not cause any work-related ill health to the mm. people that they employ and I think it's still okay for that person. So you can have both. So you have an employer that is looking after individuals from a health, safety, welfare point of view, but that person will still make mistakes. Mm. That person will, you know, you know, I mean, it's the biggest learn, isn't it? You make mistakes and hopefully you don't do it again because mm, yeah. <laughs> um, you've you know you've shit yourself and that you're going to get fired and and all all these things happen you know as a nurse um i've made some awful mistakes but you would like to think in the nhs which is a whole different culture that you put your hands up and you say i've made a mistake and you know okay well this is how this is how how we how we tackle it but i i think yeah so i think employers still have a responsibility to create good working environments for people however people still have to uh not go it alone but they still have to have the opportunity to let to learn to find it mm. tough to feel awkward you know all those things still happen yeah the well the well-being doesn't take that away see i think yeah no i agree um I, th I think where the problem is it's just this line right it's just so blurred and i, th I feel like we're, we're we're quite often doing people a disservice by not defining what that line is just very yeah. clearly just being like right this is our responsibility and this is your responsibility you know yeah. go and get your shit together and we'll get our shit together we'll, we'll always have yeah. your back but this is your thing and i think this is the problem because of so many i mean companies obviously don't want to do that and and can't do that probably even if they wanted to um, but it's 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 recognizing that if somebody has shit going on outside of their work life mm -hmm. that quite often whatever they have going on cannot be separated when they walk through that mm -hmm. door or they yeah. switch the laptop on yeah some things can be that extreme that they can't yeah. leave that outside and yeah. if an employer if you can help support that person because if you don't what it what's happening so either they just kind of wing it through and their productivity is is on the floor mm -hmm. um that has a knock-on effect on the rest of their team because the person sat next to them is now doing the work of two people mm -hmm. um that person um gets stressed they take time off someone else in the team is having mm -hmm. um to do now doing the work of three people so you've got a team of six people um and you've now got um four people doing the work of six because one's you know it, it's the knock-on effect so as an employer if you can do something to support that person then that is much better for your um profitability mm -hmm. than it is to do nothing and that's that's where people are missing the point it's yeah. like so that person might be at your organization for a year um you could have supported them and guess what They're, they've got this great um perception of your company of the culture um that they feel more loyal 
to you they have better morale for mm. coming in they can say oh do you know what like th this is challenging you will support them um then that that is much better for the culture that you're creating with your business which has a direct impact on your bottom line profits but also if you don't do anything and that person is not being productive and then they leave then you just like you know throwing you know money away basically because mm. that the retention piece is really important mm. and you know i, I think it's, it's difficult there's no black or white answer because it might be there isn't because the e person. equally you know you sorry to interrupt but like it's just okay. just what um, it's in my head equally there's the other side to that which is like let's say a vp of that particular department for for that individual you just talked about looks at that on on black and white on a piece of paper you know report given by the, the leaders it's just like fire them yeah like it's, it's a pretty cut and dry answer there you know in terms of you know financially like this person was performing they're now no longer performing their lack of performance is now affecting the performance of others around them and their team yeah. why them like that's a that's a sunken cost fallacy that right right there that you know that the return on the investment on this individual isn't isn't there like so you've been and you've been trying to help them for x amount of time you've been trying to give them support and plenty of opportunities to improve that fire them they, that, that's it right and then bring someone else in who's going to do the job so it's it you know it's difficult because I understand both sides of it, but but then equally I suppose there's the other the, the catch twenty two there is you fire them well then what what damage can that do to your core culture of your company? But what message does that send? Is that going to be de demotivating? You know, um, and actually have further implications, which I have also seen. So it's like yeah. this is this is where it's difficult. Isn't and it? and there is a difference between someone that's never been a a great performer. Right. and someone who was performing good mm. and then it slipped what's yeah, happened for that performance to slip yeah because yeah, yeah. if they've had it all and then it's gone then you know that they can be mm. you know a really good employee so there's this it's either personal or there's a failing in your business where yeah. that person has become disengaged with the environment or the their, their working life quite um, often i've seen that happen as a result of someone of, of a structural change within the business so usually another manager being hired yeah is, uh, funnily enough usually the, the the telltale sign of when you start seeing perform uh, people who usually perform stopping to perform which is obviously the opposite of what you would expect to see you would yeah. expect to see you put a new manager in place well then suddenly people are going to perform even better you see high performers suddenly dip you're like wait a minute what's happening there it's like oh okay they yeah. probably wanted to have that job and yeah. now they're suddenly demotivated, you know. Yeah, yeah. and 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 this is the whole point of me measurements and benchmarking. Yeah, because when you know the people that are in your organisation, when you are regularly having conversations and embed these conversations into the the culture around. I mean, well, be it's it's hard without like we spoke before about language and everyone has different perceptions what does it mean but you know people being able to when you say to them oh hey how are you for them to be able to say or oh, do you know what i'm not actually that everyone everyone stands responses i'm fine when when yeah. you know you can take body language all sorts you can tell you're not i love, I love the brit the very standard british answer not too bad yeah not too bad. yeah <laughs> all right so well, in the middle isn't it yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's just, sad but it's not yeah. too bad <laughs> yeah. so it, it, it's about having these processes in place where you are getting to know the team that you manage mm. and i think not enough time is allocated to managers to do the people stuff mm. they're still expected to do the role they were doing before mm. and take all this new stuff on board and there's yeah. not enough hours in the day for them to do that so i think organizations need to really think about what what does a manager mean for their business what does that look like um are they still doing that job before and what are your expectations and requirements of them as a manager and do they have the time mm. to do all and the training to do all the things that you're asking them to do and i think when people really know their team of people that they're working with then they can make better decisions based on uh we need to support this person more these you know these are never suited it's a it's a bad hire there's not yeah. a good you know not a good culture fit whatever the the reason but if you don't have those processes in place then basically you're just shooting in the dark yeah and and, and that's where 
So one of our taglines is based on facts, not feelings, mm. <laughs> which yeah. is, is weird because well-being is a, you know, it's a, a feeling of fe feeling good and, and happy and all these. Yeah, but it's still going to be grounded. Things. But yeah, yeah but it, it is about based in, on these facts. And it does mean that if it did, did, did come down to, you know, disciplinary, you know, further down like warnings, um, firings, mm. you have done due process and you've given people all the opportunity to kind of be open and transparent so that you can support them. And if not, then, you know, you can do that and sleep at night. And almost people sleep at night anyway. <laughs> have, yeah, to, yeah. Have, have to do that. But yeah, yeah so because ultimately, once all is said and done, the company can do everything that it that it it, it can it's capable of and doing yeah. all the things that you're saying. But ultimately, the responsibility lies with the individual um, to, yeah. to, 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 to to come through. So, yeah, and it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it's a, but it is a complex one because of you know, and, and I also don't buy this 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 narrative that um, I'm not saying you were suggesting there necessarily, but you kind of alluded to it, which which is that younger people um, are like problematic in this area. But like you know, yes, there is definitely a more awareness I think around well being and um, uh, yeah, mental health, and neurodivergence, uh, but. But e and, e and equally all the problems that come with that, you know, like, uh, you know, identity politics and all of that. But I'm not, I'm not sure if it's as prolific as people make it out to be among the younger younger population. I think it's pr primarily corporations that are actually making it out to be a bigger thing than it actually is, so, well, to there, tell you the truth. There is, there is evidence in statistics, though, around mental health that suggest young people are dis more disproportionately affected by mental ill health. Mm. Um, than in any other group in the workforce that's Deloitte um but but the thing is though that they may be more open to talk about it um which, which I would believe but I don't think that would mean that that they would be they are more disproportionately affected by mental health issues I think everyone is equally yeah regardless of age or generation or whatever just as likely to be affected by mental health issues it's just that they are younger people are more empowered to be more open about it and so statistics are going to probably skew in that direction right that's yeah, just my inclination yeah. I'm obviously not well, professional I, I agree with you that you know mental ill health doesn't discriminate on who it chooses mm -hmm. to um jump on you know jump on someone's back um my brother is a great, great example of this. My, yeah. um, my brother's generation, he's only uh, not much older than me, what, eight years older than me, nine years older than me. But like him and his friends, like, I, I've gone out with them and stuff. You know, he had a, he got married a couple of years ago. We went on a stag do and whatever. And we sat there and I'm talking, oh, how are you guys? Because I know him quite well since I was, a, you know, you know, kid and stuff. I've, you know, we've grown up together. And, you know, they'd be telling me about stuff and they, they open up like, you know, eventually. But it's like completely different. Even, even just that, it's like worlds apart. They're not talking about how they feel to anyone right yeah. you know these these are these are men's men right they're not going to talk about it they're, they're in their for, you know mid 40s late 40s they're not talking about how they feel their workplace doesn't give you know probably give a shit or at least they think their workplace doesn't give a shit yeah. how they feel like, as far as they're concerned they're just getting in they're doing their job and they're going home and they're looking after their families and this is this isn't like old old like the way a lot of people think like older generations this is this is not far away from us at all no, but and they're yet, in they're in the highest uh, age group for male suicide. Right, and they are all suffering from anxiety and depression. Every single one of them, right? Like seriously, without Do without question. Doctor Greg, they, they are because they told me they are. Yeah, right? they are. They, but but they're like, oh yeah, we just don't talk about it. Like you know, no one wants to hear about it. You know, my missus doesn't want to hear about it. My mates don't want to hear about it. You know. It's like, oh shit, there's a serious problem here, like of quiet yeah. mental illness. Whereas, yeah, okay, it's great that we've got we've got now to a point where the younger generation can feel like talking about it, but it feels to be, you know, the focus is now on them. It's like this this isn't a new thing. <laughs> For me, the more concerning the thing is like the generation of especially men who just won't talk about it. Like that's yeah. a, that's a, you know the one that's quiet, the one that's not saying anything. It's like shit. What's wrong with you? Like yeah. you know, yeah. Why know. I'm not I'm not a professional. I'm just I'm just talking bullshit. But you you know what I'm saying? Like this is just the the, the perception I get from just talking to people yeah. and being out there. It's just I, I don't think taking that statistic as like a holy grail and saying well young people are disproportionately likely to be affected by these issues is is good enough because it's like well that's 
that's data which is easily biased based on on a number of different things you know well i think going um back to societal issues around young people i think the introduction of um, digital devices and always being on and mm. social media are playing a huge part of contributing to that in terms of um, keeping up, you know, seeing everyone's perfect life online, um, mm. trolling, like, you know, all there's just there's so much for them to be dealing with and processing. Yeah. It's it, it is challenging. But I think you're absolutely right that and and, you know, we're not talking about age discrimination in, in any way. And when we do look at suicides, the, the rate is ha is higher in um, males age, uh, I think it's 40, 45 and above. Um, and I think it is the whole fact about them not being not feeling that they're able to talk about it. It's the mm. stigma attached to mental ill health. Um, and I think that is the, diff the generational difference where we need to break down more barriers with it is, but also I think that there's there's a gender thing here too, which is that, that generally speaking, a man, and I can say this as a man quite confidently, if a man was to talk about his struggles publicly um, or, or, you know, to his work or to his family and things, the vast majority of the time it is met with not the same reception it is when, if, if a woman was to talk about their, their emotional well-being. It's, you know, there is there are some, and I'm not saying this is all the time, but, the, the you know, for the, we're talking about generally, right? So very yeah. generally. But the general consensus is if a man, you know, if a man's going through some shit, it's like, well, tough, suck it up, kid. Like, you know, just get on with it. And, and up. Yeah. And so, and 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 th that that is a very common thing that you hear when you ask men about why they don't talk about their struggles, you know, especially if it's like, you know, are you struggling in your relationship? Have you talked to your, to your partner about it? <laughs> no. Like, why would I? It's just going to cause an argument. You know, are you struggling with looking after your kids? Have you talked to your to your family about it? No, why would I? That's just going to get me judged. You know, like you're struggling with your work. No, that was just going to, you know, would you mention it to your boss? No, that would just get me fired. Like, there's a certain element of just like, well, suck it up. And 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 so it's no no surprise that they don't talk about their stuff because every time they've tried in the past, they just get told to shut up. But that but that's this that stig that stigma attached with it, and why aware raising awareness and finding that common language is is really important yeah yeah so that right, right. so that we're creating safe spaces because we're talking mm. about psychologically safe environments here where mm. men don't feel that they are able to put their hands up and say i need a little help here or i'm struggling mm. um and the what perfect place to do that than than in the workplace mm. but that has to change with the predominantly male-led leadership teams that have probably placed this stigma on the workplaces with the language that they use mm -hmm. um, to to their to their teams. So people have probably gone to their boss or manager and said, "Oh, you know, uh, but I'm struggling a bit with this, blah blah blah." And they say, "Oh, what's 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 wrong with you? Like, you know, get on with it, pull, pull your socks up." Mm -hmm. um, don't be a girl. <laughs> Don't mm. be a wuss. You know all, all all this derogatory language that's that's used, but that has to come from leadership. Leadership has to change, mm. and I think this is where I, I know I know plenty of instances where they've had the similar responses from from female leaders too. Yeah. I don't th I don't think that it is it is a, a gender thing in 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 terms of the way it's responded to. I I, I yeah. disagree. I disagree with that. I don't I don't think that's the case. I think it, it is just an expect. It's just something that's said to people to men predominantly who, who yeah. whenever they sort of moan about things, well, uh, my, regardless of who was, they moan to. Yeah, I wasn't saying that it's men that said it, but predominantly leadership, especially in tech, yeah, is 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 male. So yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. In that sense, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I, but I, yeah, but I'm just yeah. It's good to clarify though that. that but at least I don't think, and by the sounds of it, you don't think either, yeah. that that's the reason why they get sort of told to to piss off. It's just it just so happens that most of them are men, which is ironic because you think that they would be a bit more understanding, being of the same gender, yeah. but clearly not. I think it's just the fact that that a lot of leaders are very bad at taking any kind of um, knowing how to deal with this kind of stuff, which is why yeah. you, you know you're in business, right? Which is why you've probably got more work than you can than you can manage, and and deservedly so, because it's just something that a lot of leaders aren't prepared to deal with when someone comes to them and says, "I'm struggling. I don't know what to do. 
Um, and in some ways, you know, they might look at it as not being their responsibility, going back to what we talked about that line. They might just be like, yeah. well, I'm sorry, but this isn't my responsibility, right? You know, go and see a therapist. Like, you know, what can I do? And in yeah. some ways, you can't blame them if they've never had any training in that. Yeah. That respect. Like, you know, how to but, deal with that. But, you know, what can I do? Or maybe I shouldn't be asking you to work 60 hours a week. Right. You know? Yeah, there's a start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what can I do? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so, take take uh, a, take some breaks. Like, yeah, let's reduce your workload. Like stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then, but then equally, like you know that 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 can be. And and look again, I can only speak as a man. But like I know for myself, like if I had, there were times in my life where I should have spoken up. For example, about the way I was yeah. feeling in workplaces, and times when I had, and times when it went well, and times it didn't, etc. But there's definitely been times where I know that if I had spoken up, I probably would have got that response. Take some time off. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take some of the work off your desk. We can give it to so-and-so. I knew that would have been the response because I had caring managers that would have would have done that. And that's exactly why I didn't go to them. Because if I didn't want time off, I didn't want to have, you know, responsibilities yeah. taken off my desk. I wanted to be able to, to see them through because of, for me, that was my purpose, you know. And purpose is a really important thing, isn't it, you know, for everyone. But as a man, I just knew that, you know, that, that for me, a man or not, like that was a really important factor into not saying I'm struggling. It was like, I want to I want to do this. I enjoy doing this. And if this is taken away from me, yes, it would be useful for like a week. But then when I come back, I'm not going to have this thing that I love. And I and I want and I don't want that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, and, it's, never, and this, it's never that simple, is it? And, and this is where like reasonable adjustments that employers can put in place are really really important but it why they have to look at how work is created within their organization mm. because telling telling an employee just take a week off and come back when mm. you come back they've not addressed the root cause of the problem yeah yeah, yeah. And, and this is what happens all the time nobody's addressing the root cause of the problem mm. so no amount of yoga or annual leave or pieces of fruit or playing ping pong in your <laughs> lunch break is going to stop the problems mm. from reoccurring yeah. you need to address why it's happening in the first place and i'm sure if it's happening to you or a person it's happening to lots of other people oh, yeah. within that organization as well so i think opportunities are often missed mm. to reevaluate what's going on how is work allocated or how do we do things in this business mm. that gets, you know, keeps people healthier for longer whilst they're in that organization. And keeps and them sane, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sanity is, a, is, a, uh, is underrated these days. Well, look, I wanted to ask a bit more about your background because obviously when we spoke before and, and, and just earlier, you mentioned about the fact that you, you used to work in the NHS. You still, you still are a practicing nurse in the NHS. I right? am, yes. You, you are. Good, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 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 tell me a bit more about that, and how how did that sort of bring you to to what you're doing now? Because that's a really interesting journey. Yeah. So, um, I've been a nurse for twenty twenty one years this this year. Right. Um, a, wee, a wee while, and <laughs> congratulations. I, thank you. <laughs> Uh, waiting on a clock or something arriving soon. I don't know if they still, <laughs> still dish dish them out. The NHS, but, yeah, NHS, yeah, you'd be lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're lucky to get a letter. <laughs> oh, that 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 is true. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I suppose um, you can probably tell from my dulcet tones. And so I'm based in Manchester, but I'm originally from from Glasgow. And at the age of seventeen, I decided that I was going to be a pop star. So mm. I moved all the way from Glasgow to Manchester on my own at 17. And mm. uh, as, you, as you can see, that didn't quite work out. So uh, <laughs> a, different kind, a different kind of pop star. Yes, a, a star. Um, <laughs> so um, that didn't work out. So I thought, oh, best get a, a proper job. And actually, before I left school, I had considered a, a becoming a nurse because at the age of 11 I was diagnosed as type 1 diabetic and I had back then you had to spend two weeks in hospital and I was um let's say there was a, a nurse there that basically made my life hell the whole time I was there she was horrible I thought why oh. is she why is she even a nurse type type thing mm -hmm. so I I often had in the back of my mind that actually 
if I could be a nurse and make someone else's experience better than that, then mm. that would that would be a good thing to do. But six months after my diagnosis, my dad had a massive heart attack and nearly died. So I spent a long time um, or a lot of my time in and out of clinical and uh, medical situations with myself and my dad. My dad never, uh, luckily he, he survived. Um, but you know, so yes, from a socially deprived uh, area in, in Glasgow, so outcomes weren't as good as they should have been. So I'd done uh, the next best thing and moved to Manchester to be a pop star because it's the same. Uh, so that didn't work out. <laughs> Uh, went to University of Manchester, done my nurse training, and I've I've been in Manchester uh, ever since. Um, mm. So yeah, so most of my nursing experience has been in general practice. Mm. So lots of chronic disease management, public health promotion, public health screening. And in 2016, I made the decision to leave because I was burnt out, but not burnt out in the traditional tech sense. I was bur burnt out emotionally. Mm. I there was a huge disconnect on the reasons I became a nurse and the impact and the outcomes that I thought I could achieve for my patients and actually what was allowed to happen too much red tape bureaucracy and I was if I'm honest I was fed up of seeing people when it was too late when they'd already had a heart attack a stroke mental health breakdown cancer diagnosis and saying mm. here, here you go Dave here's a diet sheet I've just printed off it's 10 years out of date um now mm. you've had this huge life crisis like go in you know uh, eat less fat like I mean yeah. come on now so too, I, little, too little too late yeah. yeah so um so I made the decision to leave and done various bits and bobs and then 2018 2019 I started thinking about what could I do that would allow me to use my all my nursing knowledge and skills that I could create a, a legacy a, a, a scalable impact business um where I wouldn't have to return to the NHS <laughs> and that's kind of how in-house health was born so I found corporate well-being and just seen that same stick and plaster approach being used that is is used um you know well-being initiatives that are reactive, fluffy, unmeasured, having no long-term impact on people's health outcomes and certainly no financial benefits for businesses that are deciding to invest in them. Mm. And I was like, yeah, I know, I can like save the world, super nurse, I'll go in, I'll do health checks, yada, 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 yada. And then COVID happened. And I was like, oh shit, what do I do now? So <laughs> um, I started looking at data and how data has shaped health policy for quite some time how uh, evidence-based research comes about and actually how we were being told what we could could and couldn't do with our lives whether we could see our loved ones whether we could go to the gym mm -hmm. and then I started looking at businesses and they were measuring everything but not measuring anything around employee well-being apart from your bog standard absence rates and um holidays and things mm. like that so I thought you know what I can through building this data informed tech backed and tech enabled uh, business that will allow me to create that 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 vision and, and mission of having impact and I suppose the wider dream really is to have enough employee health data to really impact health policy and strategy so it's relevant for working age people which mm. is now like most of your life because <laughs> yeah. the pension age keeps going up yeah. and up and up so 18 to 70 it's probably going to be it, it's point. just going to be until death at some point. yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in, in the near future mm. and to contribute to the prevention and long-term conditions because as a nation we're not a healthy nation and so many of the conditions we have these days are preventable mm. so so that's kind of my personal and professional goals for those two things but in the meantime, if I can improve outcomes for businesses, which impacts individuals and their families and their communities, then I think that's a really um, admirable and um, great thing to do. And it's mm. always something that's that's been in been in there. So, so yes, yeah, so that's kind of how in house health came about and how we ended up being um, 
a kind of well well tech i think is the label people put well on tech. Yeah, well yeah. tech startup but Does, I, do you find that being a nurse uh, affords you some sort of uh, amount of credibility when going when approaching these 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 um these companies to say like you know this is me this is my background this I, i'm not coming into this as you know someone completely alien to uh to to to, to, to medical to, to health to well-being like you, you're not you're not just some well-being guru that's just decided they know everything about it right which there's a lot of people out there that might be good might not be i don't know but yeah do you, do you feel like that that ad, that added a certain amount of credibility to be able to get a foot in the door when you started out in this journey yeah, I, th I think definitely adds that that credibility. I've had to do a hell of a lot of work in terms of raising my profile because I had no network um, right. when I entered the business world. So a lot of work on LinkedIn in terms of building that visibility, yeah. building networks. Um, so I think I've reached 10,000 connections, over 10,000 followers. So doing quite well mm. on there, building, building my funnel, building my community which is which is good mm. but you know that i think the issue when it comes to well-being is that it's saturated it is a saturated mm. marketplace but it ranges from free fruit and a cycle to work scheme to mental health first aid training to all the way up to the data end and getting to the root cause of problems like what we're trying to do so yeah. i think it's really overwhelming for business leaders to mm. pick what they do to what they invest in mm. um and of course i'm going to say it but what we do should be what you do first because yeah. you need to be able to identify where your problems are um before you start spending money on things because yeah, 100%. Yeah. They're, they're just they are never going to work and they're not working because the statistics mm. getting worse year on year what related ill health is worsening what, mm. Why is that? It's because all people are uh, well-being washing, they're ticking boxes and saying, oh, we do well-being. Uh -huh. mm. And and also because so many more people, are, you know, everyone and their mother has a startup, right? So it's just yeah. like, you know, the more businesses you have run by more people who are less experienced, who haven't gone to business school, who haven't learned these management uh, skill sets. And there's no standard, accredited standard for how to build or manage a culture um, and manage people's well-being really like you know having done you know business management myself you know university that there, there's very little in there about about any of that sort of stuff like so because there's not, not a standard across the board even those that did go to some formal education through it aren't going to have it let alone people who were just like fresh out of college decided to create a startup get some money together like from friends and family and then suddenly they're responsible for you know 50 people 100 people it's like well of course they're not going to know how to fucking do any of this stuff like no. <laughs> you know? and, and this is a problem though in the the corporate well-being sector is that mm. there is no regulation there's no standardization within the industry itself yeah. so you do have people that are well-being gurus that mm. predominantly so what i've i've seen a, a huge rise since covid whose businesses have gone belly up so they see well-being as a cash cow and they can mm. you know they might have the technical experience or whatever to develop an app that focuses on in individuals yeah um or i'm seeing a lot of people with lived experience who have had their own adversities and are like mm. oh yeah i can do workplace well-being mm. and i and i'm not saying they're, ba they're bad people or they're bad at what they do however coming through your own adversity, dealing with your own challenges and problems and finding your own solutions, doesn't mean that that's a rinse and repeat for everyone mm. else. You need to have that clinical yeah. knowledge behind what you're doing mm. um, to be able to, to support businesses to make the effective changes that they need without damaging. A friendly reminder to share this episode with your network. Subscribe for more and join the conversation in the comments. It really helps us out. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the health and well-being of, of the staff. Mm. And, so, and without damaging the the, 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 the the operational foundations of the, 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 the organization itself, right, which is incredibly important. Like you've yeah. rightly pointed out, you, you spend a lot of time focusing on operational side of things for a business, which I think is completely the right approach. You know, it needs to be, like you said, facts. It needs to be data-led and it needs to be tied 
to the overall success of the company. That is the approach. And whereas a lot of these gurus are just come in and the first thing they do is like, right, we'll do a workshop, guys. Like, you know, this is what we should be focusing on. This is how we can build countries. Like, wait a minute, you've not done any discovery. You've not spoken to anyone there. You have, you know, you're not spoke to any of the executives. You have no idea how this company is structured. And yet you're suddenly now telling everyone what to do. Like, that's not going to do anything. Like, it might make one person happy, two people happy, but it's not going to have any long term impact. Yeah. In the same way that I can go into a company and do a workshop about, you know, how to be better at selling or how to be better at marketing or how to improve the customer funnel and all that sort of nonsense. But unless I'm actually speaking to people and getting my, you know, my, my nose on the ground and, you know, learning what the product is, learning what the customer base is and people's strengths and weaknesses and all that, what their policies are, like, there's no, there's no proper advice that can be given, surely, you know, no. every, every situation is unique and different. So, yeah, yeah and, you're absolutely right. But it is trendy, you know, it's, it's a trendy, oh. in the same way that like um, uh, consultants around diversity and inclusion is trendy, or, yeah. you know, anti-racism or gender equality uh you know all this kind of thing it's gender all pay gap. Yeah, yeah it's in the pay gap all of this is trendy stuff to have you know to to be able to say for large corporations especially we've got some consultants and to talk about it and and unfortunately in my opinion unfortunately some of these consultants do extraordinarily well but it's all just um it's just posturing there's no substance to anything that they no. do no you know? and really I mean, what it should just say is like, just don't be a dick. <laughs> That's like, you know, it, I'm applying yeah. for an Innovate UK grant at the minute, and you've I've had to do a whole section on equality, diversity, and inclusion, which is really, really important. Mm. But really, I just want to write in the four hundred word, word the four hundred word limit is don't be a dick. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. back to basics, like you know, take everyone at face value. Don't don't discriminate. Just don't. Yeah. Be a dick. But it's uh, yeah, it, it is challenging. But it's I, rem I remember. Sorry, you just reminded me of something. Okay. I remember working at a, a company. I was a consultant there at the time, and I was, but I was quite heavily embedded in the company. And I was there when they were doing it. They had they had called a consultant in, another consultant to do a diversity and inclusion workshop. And I was sat there, and and my God, was it the most disengaged workshop I'd ever seen in my life? No one gave a shit. We're, I'm looking across the room, and it is the most diverse and inclusive room that you could find, right? Yeah. Most startups are, which is really ironic about this fucking thing as well. But anyway, um, maybe not at the beginning, but they they usually become that later on. And and I'm looking around, and and, and halfway through this workshop, she asks for questions or whatever, and this one kid pipes up and he goes, um, "I'm not saying that I am." But if I was racist, um, would there would I be discriminated discriminated against for my beliefs? Because he was talking about how everyone's beliefs are equal in the yeah. yeah. And he was like, I had never seen someone so stumped in her life. She was like, you could see her working it out. And she's right. like, well, technically not. I was like, but I'm, but I'd be racist though. Like, and you just said that that isn't that isn't right. It's like, yeah, but. But if it's your views and you believe them, then you're entitled to your views. And it's like, okay, you just lost us. You've like, yeah. you've like this whole thing's fallen apart. Like, you know, <laughs> you, like you said, just don't be a dick. That's the yeah. main thing. If you if you have if you have dickish beliefs, fine, just keep them to yourself. Like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's, a, oh, it's just I thought it was hilarious. I was well, cracking up. <laughs> talk, talk, talking about this, like just going back to the investors, a lot of people do keep them to themselves, but it it shows in their behaviors. Yeah. You know, I was recently um featured in a prolific north article around female founders raising investment in the north. Mm. Um and the amount of sexism and misogyny I faced from investors around um being female is like well, it's like what the fuck is like 2023 like what's mm -hmm. what is going on here like you know it's not the 1950s anymore and the so thing is i'm always very wary about these statistics again like i'm, I'm okay i'm a skeptic uh -huh. i think this yeah. is this is my problem and again i just i get really wary about this this sort of data like you know in the same way we see that with like you know there's there's not enough amount of female founders there's not enough uh you know founders of color there's not etc cetera, etc cetera. we see all this data but the reality is if you really look back into this data and where it originates from a lot of it makes sense like you know a lot of it is in terms of the you know the proportion of you know individuals uh who you know let's say uh are interested in certain subjects at school who are female that, that have then you know make up the pool that our founders you know are then female and so on if you actually follow the the, the data all the way along 
like you said, you know, data, not your feelings, right? If you yeah. actually follow that all through, then it kind of makes sense that you've got an uh, underrepresented amount of people of color in this sort of um, uh, in the entrepreneurial realm or or or, or or, or females and or homosexuals or, or whatever, right? It kind of all of these numbers make sense. The and then so because of that it undermines that data, then it makes me go, well, wait a minute. Should we then be questioning the data like you've just mentioned of the amount of misogyny and, and, and sexism face? Like what what is that being based on? What's the benchmark for misogyny and sexism? Like yeah. what who's deciding what misogyny and sexism is? How is it being expressed explicitly? You know what I mean? Like, what does that mean? Because it's well, such an arbitrary yeah. term, and it, and well, it's very uh, subjective to be yeah. to said. I didn't get funding because of they were sexist. It's like, well, how did they say we're not giving you money because you're a woman? Like, how do you know? No, that's, that's that's my point that people keep those feelings to themselves. Right, but the but point is, we're making the assumption to... that it's because of sexism, but so, it might not be. It might just be that their startup was shit. No, so when uh, <laughs> so for example, that that is that is true as well, and. I am of the belief, like I'm quite, um, you know, I do a lot of like male dominated things. So like play, play golf, play, uh, love football, play poker. So I spend a lot of time with men. So you got and, me a poker. The other two, I can, <laughs> I can leave those. But poker, so, I'm, I'm in. I'm interested in that. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at the the level where I'm like, it's 2023. Like I spend a lot of time and deal with men. Most of them are are brilliant and incredible, really genuinely supportive. Um, I've seen all these figures about uh, women getting investment and mm. blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, you know, those those statistics may exist. Mm. However, I am me and I'm going to go out there and it's, you know, I take it, everything at face value. It is what it is. I make my own assumptions. But like, two of the things i've had so i've had a meeting with an investor who told me um at the end of the conversation i had the right skill set I, I had good uh, founder market fit i was so you know my solution was a um was solving real problems that i've identified he knew the space well i could really fit into that market the market there's an opportunity for what i'm building that's different to 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 what's there and th and then it wasn't a bot but then he proceeded to say oh i can really see this being like 500k a year business right so i was like oh you mean a lifestyle business and he was like well well like i think like 500k is like good so I was like, at what point in my deck, at what point during our conversation have I said to you that I am building a lifestyle business? Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what I'm here for. Yeah. And he was like, oh, well, uh, 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 and he really didn't know what to say. And I was like, did you not look at the financial forecast? It's 1.2 million annual recurring revenue mm. by the end of year two following investment. And it's and it's that type of bias where he's like, oh yeah, little woman, you would be happy with I, like in his. But, but his how? But how do you know yeah. that's? But how do you know that's? This is kind of my point, yeah. and I'm not saying that it isn't. But how do you know that that's because of your gender that he made that error? Because like it could I, just be because he didn't take the time to read the deck. No, but I have I have spoken, and I'm in uh, you know well connected in the startup scene, mm. and I've never heard of anyone been said that to from an investor right. i don't i don't think that would have been said to a man right. um i've been at pitching events where as the only female uh pitcher um where i've, I've been doing um my investment pitch so one of eight, one of eight founders only female where the questions i have been asked are absolutely ridiculous such as um so um i done my pitch um and i well it, it wasn't even a question it was more of a statement where this uh, old guy was like oh i'm confused so i was like oh sorry to hear that like <laughs> <laughs> just in general <laughs> you know I mean? like, yeah, are you in the oh, wrong sorry. room or something yeah yeah you, know I mean? like, you should use you know, our services right? yeah, <laughs> there are toilets there like do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and he proceeded to grill me on my very, very, very easy to follow 
um, very, I suppose, not inflated market research, total, addre total addressable market, mm -hmm. exit strategy, etc. And I explained to him um, this, 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 X, Y, and Z. Are you still confused? Uh, no, 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 no. Mm. So that would had never come about for any of the other eight who all had a few had bullshit on the slides, mm. um, etc. And it, it, it wasn't even a question. It was just a, a, this like bold statement. Like I, I just when he said it, I was like. Uh, don't take it personal like in, in my head I was like um, mm. don't get emotional like all these things but afterwards I had six investors come up to me and say I'm really sorry about that man right and he shouldn't have done that and like I could see the audience were all looking at each other mm. and they're saying he was out of order yeah and I was like well no go and tell him don't tell me yeah, yeah. Like, you know, they're like, oh, you handled it really well. Like, you know, you came out like on top of that one. And it's like, well, go and tell him. In the same event, I was also asked, um, was my all female team by design? Mm. And I was like, yeah, I'd like, hate men, they're all dicks. Like, of course, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was like, my my developer is ex head of software engineering for booking.com. And my board advisor built a SaaS business in the 80s when girls didn't do that thing, listed it on AIM and sold it in 2017 for millions and millions. Like, I bring people on board because they're incredible people, not because of their gender. Um, so that was my answer. But afterwards, I said to the, the person asking that question, I was like, I, I feel like that question was really inappropriate. Mm. Um, but like I you said, said, no one's probably telling him that, right? Because yeah. he's got Because he's got money and power. And so, you know, no one's yeah. probably willing to risk their careers yeah. or, or their prospects by saying, dude, that was completely inappropriate. Yeah. Why did you ask for that? Yeah. yeah. And he was like, oh, no, I, I just thought it was like really good. It was an all female team. And I was like, well, what you should have said then is, oh, wow, it's really good to see that you've got an all female team. If anyone in this room is uh, a member of the Investing in Women Code, this would be a really good startup for you business to look at, mm. um, et cetera. And yeah. You know, all the men that stood up with their all white men teams. Mm. Why didn't you ask them, is there is their team by design? Yeah. Where is the diversity in their team? Not asking me when I'm the minority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that's the type of differences in behaviors mm -hmm. that you are subject to, subjected to. And that must go through people's minds when they are looking at your business, looking at your deck, having conversations. Mm. There are other things, but, you know, that's just, like, the ones that stand out yeah. in my mind, where I just think, really? Like, come on. Mm. Like, you know, I'm credible. I've got the the knowledge, the experience to, like, make this business huge commercial success, as well as it being uh, having huge social impact. Mm. Of course, I get investment, but the reality is that I see other people, um, predominantly men, get money for the the, sh the shitty things <laughs> i've ever seen do you know what i mean it's just like you know mm. i don't i don't like pulling other people down but it's just it's it's cha it's challenging it's, diff it's difficult yeah no i can imagine it is but, and, but you know look i like playing devil's advocate in these conversations yeah. so it's good to explore that and for you to sort of to, to, to well i learned um something there but 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 um it's interesting that question around your team and like you know was that a choice is it I can kind of, again, to play devil's advocate, I can kind of understand where that question might have been coming from. From, So I'll throw this out there and see if this this feels like it might be right. I don't know. But there's there's a lot of emphasis on on the, these topics right now, yeah. right, around building a team that is inclusive and et cetera, et cetera. And what's ironic about that is quite often what that means is ignoring straight white males. Right. So yeah. you can have a whole team that it has every color and gender under the sun, but excludes straight white male specifically. And of course, for me, that isn't diversity. That is yeah. that is that is actually the opposite of diversity. That is going out intentionally to exclude a group, which last yeah. time I checked was a form of prejudice. So I think that, you know, quite often these questions are being asked because um, it feels like it's the right thing to ask. You know, a lot of female founders are coming out there and I think wrongly so. To complete to be completely categorical and i think you've probably been in agreement with this 
um, and saying, I am specifically for me, you know, uh, creating a team of female founders, female teams, and da, 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 da. that's yeah. very intentionally the, the main sort of focal point of the business, as if it's some sort of massive thing we should all applaud. When, like you've rightly pointed out, you should be hiring the best people for the job, yeah. and that should be the first and foremost thing. So, so, so I feel like maybe that question, and I, again, I could be wrong, but I've I've seen that question be asked, and the response to that is quite often, yes, thank you for noticing. Yeah, it is. It is what we've decided to do because we want to empower women and we want more women in power and this. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, so maybe that's why the question was being asked because of the response he was expecting yeah. was maybe the response that he's getting across the board when it maybe even when he asked, you know, black founders, you know, oh, you know, is your is your team entirely black because uh, by design? And, yeah. you know, you, do you see what I mean? Like, does, well, does that, that... when I when I spoke to him, that wasn't he was like, oh, I was meaning it was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, just fucking say that. Like, mm. you, like, don't ask, try and be a smart ass. Just, just, just say it. <laughs> say it if you think it's good. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't but the thing like, is, well, the thing is, I would, I would argue that, that that as an answer isn't a good enough answer either. Because why is it a good thing? It doesn't yeah. matter. Like, and th this is what boggles my mind about equality. No, but you, it doesn't matter but, that you're all it, female. It, what matters is that you, like you said, the the you know the experience of the individuals yeah. where they work the competency that they bring to the table then the chances of success is increased because of that you as as founders have come together that's yeah. what's important like you know him to say well because I think it's a great thing why it makes no fucking mm -hmm. difference that well, we're because, all female because you're all you know? like little women doing like right it's like go for power more power to you that kind yeah. of thing I I find that more undermining than just saying. Well, because if I thought maybe that this was some sort of, you know, like agenda, agenda. or something. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you'd just been open and said that, maybe, like, I just yeah. wanted to, I just wanted to tell whether or not this was like some sort of political move. Like, that would have yeah. probably, that was probably his his real answer, but he didn't want to say that because he didn't want to, you know, get in more trouble than he was already in. Yeah, a bigger bollock in. <laughs> yeah. But, but the I, thing I, is, though, but the thing is, like, that's rooted in common sense, like, in a sense of there's uncertainty on how to navigate these waters. It's, you know, you can get cancelled for all kinds of shit these days. So, like, people's very, you know, they're very tricky on this subject. They don't want to give their real I opinion. Think, I think playing devil's advocate and going back to saying, you know, women are saying, oh, we are building all female teams and we are designing it that way. I think men have done that for a long time. But, yeah, but it's never been intentional. No. Well, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure about that, but I think they have just never come out loud and said it. Um, and the, because of media, because of agendas and funding in different areas, I think people have seen a, an opportunity to raise their profile by being controversial by highlighting that you know it's it's like B Corp and other you know business for good. Mm -hmm. We do this. So therefore, a certain cohort of people will be invested in doing business with us, or you know, we will tick tick boxes, tick boxes yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in in that way. So I think that's it. And for full disclosure, I now have a um, fifty plus uh, white male on my board. <laughs> so. <laughs> So yes, because but again, he, but again, I, I just don't right think it matters. Right, exactly, and, and again, it's like business. it doesn't matter. Like I think we no. need to stop seeing people by by color and gender and all that. It just doesn't matter. Like and you have you have the best board uh, yeah. that you want. That's what matters. Like and and for any, it feels like it, these are external forces telling us what should matter in yeah. an organization. They don't. And I think you know, if you go to like Scandinavian countries, for example, are you going to get diversity in 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 skin color in 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 companies that are, are born? no? Of course you're not. It's you know, are you if you go to um, to some third world countries where you know some uh, or maybe even some very extreme religious countries where women don't have certain rights or or, or haven't had the the opportunities of education, are you going to see a mixture in gender in companies being founded? No, you're not. Like it. it I mean, yeah, that's a whole different issue that maybe needs to be tackled. But you see my point. It's like these conversations don't even exist in these places. It seems yeah. to be only in already diverse cultures that we're insistent on there being a, a diverse representation of the, the, the culture around. That does happen, usually later stages. But the truth is, when someone has mates that they went to school with, like you or whatever, or they, they have circles professionally, they're just going to hire people they know or people they get introduced to. And as soon as you start, like, 
actively trying to seek out diversity, I think you just generally weaken your position as a business. You're not actually being diverse. Diversity is more than just color and gender. It's about thinking. And that's yeah, something that's, that's, a of, that's missing. Diversity of thought is, is really, right. really important. That, that is far more important. And, and if you want to get someone into your team because you want the diversity of a woman's perspective, especially as it maybe relates to your business, fine. I'm not, I have no issue with that. Or well, you want to bring someone in because of the cultural diversity that that applies because, of again, it plays a direct role in your business. Let's say you're serving those sort of um, those markets or whatever it might be then fine, good reason to hire someone. But if you're doing it just because it, it you know, it seems, a box. right, ticks a box or somehow yeah. appeases the equality gods, there's a problem there. You're playing, I think, a very dangerous game. In my well, like, like you mentioned before, there's that whole, by being inclusive, you end up being exclusive because you're always yeah, going to miss a certain group out. Yeah. But I just think it is it is worth, like, not having a full conversation on it. But, you know, the whole thing around diversity and leadership mm. in, and how the the facts and figures are uh, women, uh, you're the LGQPT plus, probably got that wrong, uh, community and people of colour are underrepresented still in leadership mm. roles. Um and you know it's it's well documented in like Tech Nation reports, etc. Et, et um, so so yeah, is it you know is it's never some an easy subject to talk about, but it's it's something that does still need to be spoken about so that people I agree. Are, yeah, it uh, isn't an easy subject to, be to talk about, but also I think part of the problem is that it's talked about in some ways too much, right? And we're probably adding to that noise, but it's just. I don't know, like just like you said, I think it can be a lot simpler than this. It's just don't be a dick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the thing, you know, we, we, we make it out to be this far more complicated thing. A lot of prof you know, uh, you know, political and and um, other agendas come into the equation and it just muddies the waters. It's just like just don't be a dick, just treat each other nicely, just hire the person that's right for the job. Like it doesn't need yeah. to be that complicated. Like, well, yes, we can do yeah. more, we can do more. Um, yeah. But I think that doesn't come that doesn't come with a lot of the stuff that we're told it comes from. I think a lot of it starts from sort of like education. Like, you know, why aren't we seeing as many women or people of color or, you know, uh, LGBTQ plus individuals going into roles of leadership? Well, you know, a lot of the time, maybe it's because they're not as in, you know, not as many are as interested in those in, in STEM uh, subjects and, and, in, and in areas of, of, of you know like business management and things like that so what are we doing in our education system that's putting them off right well, what can we well, do I more think that's in, in business in general but i think leadership roles is you know i think it, it all kind of it's a pipeline isn't it? it's like you said well, exactly, that's my point pipeline. so like if they're not in yeah. the pipeline of business in the first place then they're very unlikely to be in leadership roles so if they're yeah. under underrepresented you know in, in in the in the business as a whole you know, so like, so like, that's what I mean. Like, that's why I'm a huge advocate for, for you know, these organisations trying to get more, um, more diversity, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But, but you know what I mean. Like, more, more, more variety of people interested in things like STEM subjects at schools yeah. and things, because that's to me where it starts. It's like if you get people interested in those things early on, they're more likely to be in the work pool that is then. You know, then then suddenly the application rates. You see, because I know I've applied for, me uh, uh, I've hired for many, many hundreds of roles and the vast majority are men for leadership roles without a doubt yeah. but those are the applications right so you know statistically speaking i'm more likely to hire a man just simply because of the you know it's it, you know that it's stacked in that favor right you but, know but then i mean we, we could probably do another whole podcast on this and edi is not is not my my thing but you mm. know then that goes to like back to how job job adverts are written so yeah yeah you're right and um, yeah, it goes yeah. back to um people in school being able to see people that represent them or they can relate to within the roles or the careers that they're trying to pick so that it's that whole role modeling thing and that in inspirational thing so so yeah, yeah i think there's there's i think we are probably one of the better countries for it mm. but i think there is a lot more that 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 we can do we're a diverse country we're a diverse country and we're as far as last i checked we're, we're pretty you know 
good in terms of our equality, you know, um, in our country. I think we, there's a lot to be proud of. Yeah, are there places to improve on? A hundred percent. Yeah, there always are. But um, but I, I don't know. I just feel like um, there's a lot of doom and gloom over things that are actually aren't as bad as they, as people say they are. But 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 you are proof that there are certainly a huge amount of areas for improvement. Absolutely. And and what you said there was shocking. You know about the, your ex experiences. And um, I'm sure there's many other accounts that you could recall like that and others as well that you probably know. And that, that sort of stuff is totally unacceptable. You know, it's yeah. totally unacceptable. But then I just think, well, actually, I'm quite pleased that you've shown your true colours and I'm out. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. like said, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm out. Like, you know, yeah. I don't want you as an investor if that's your attitude. Yeah. 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 Because this is just the beginning of our relationship. Exactly. So exactly. if you think it's doing you a favour. Yeah, if I don't, yeah, yeah, you yeah. don't think of it. And I just yeah, yeah. like just the, the final point, probably on the diversity, is that as a as a a white straight woman, you mm. know, I, I can't represent other people's feelings and their experiences of of what what goes, you know, how how their life is for them when they feel that they're not represented or they they don't have that. But that it comes back to that whole diversity of of thought. Yeah. So as a as a white straight woman, you know, people probably think have assumptions about me, mm. but then didn't know anything about my background that I, you know, brought up in yeah. a council flat in, you know, a poor poor area in Glasgow, family with with no mon money. We had um, you know, the health issues that where my parents weren't able because they're, you know, really good people, um, but not educated to make sure that they had the best outcomes and that's impacted impacted my dad throughout his life impacted me with my own health outcomes as well being mm. from a socially deprived background so mm. just because someone looks a certain way as well doesn't mean that that's their experience or they are of a they are privileged in a certain way or, or absolutely or, or 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 queer black anyone or whatever i mean you just you're doing the same thing you just repackaged yeah. it. It's racism, but it's rebranded. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's lunacy to me. But you made a really interesting point there about economic status, which I think is is another hugely underrepresented topic in this whole discussion around equality and, and diversity and inclusion and so on, which I think is actually far more important than, than people give it credit for, you know, especially in Western society where you have people from so, certain socioeconomic backgrounds that don't have the same opportunities. Like, for example, I put an ad out on LinkedIn and Indeed for a job. Who are the people that are going to see that ad? Is it going to be those people living in a poverty, you know, under the poverty line in some, you know, sub, 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 uh, suburban part of uh, you know, London in a council, in council estates? No, it's not. It's going to be people who are already there. So the problem, like you, you made a really good point of like how we're putting the job ads, uh, you know, construct them. So yeah. I would say even further than that, how are we actually getting job ads in front of people? Like how are we actually, you know, what are we doing there? There's no, there's no gap. That, that, there's a huge gap that's not being filled between the people who are already within the sort of professional working sphere, and, you know, and that kind of thing, yeah. and those that aren't, and that could probably be really amazing, you know, in some of these roles if given the opportunity. So it's just like, what are we going to do to bridge that gap? Um, and getting these these roles in front of people like that, because that's where the opportunities come. So for me, it's that, yeah, like you said, education, you know, it's a huge thing, you know, get, setting people up to to make the right choices early on in life, you know, through diet and the way that they, you know, interact with the people that they love and all these sort of things, you know, relationships, all this sort of stuff. But then more, yeah, that that's a really big piece. And I don't know how to solve that piece. I've thought about it for so many years. Yeah, and I don't know how to solve that. There's a huge piece in Greater Manchester at the minute at the minute around social inclusion around digital inclusion mm. because so many people don't have um access to digital devices they don't have access to the internet yeah, yeah. so you know which these is crazy come, right you just don't think yeah. about that yeah yeah but just like from your basics of paying your bills on online to accessing health appointments and, yeah. and all sorts of things so never mind accessing um better jobs and, and better opportunities in life. So the um, Greater Manchester uh, Mayor, Andy Burnham, is doing a lot of work around that. And we've just had the Making Manchester Fairer programme mm -hmm. released as well, looking at all of these because of the health inequalities and work inequalities. Mm -hmm. and, and that starts from uh, birth all the way, all the way up from 
and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see if that has impact. Yeah, I think old media has a part to play in that as well, right? Like I remember seeing a, a, a startup a few years ago, their, their attempt at solving this, I can't remember where they were based now, but their attempt to solve this was to um, was to to uh, to get some billboards and do flyering for their job for their job ads. Yeah. So they were actually going out into their local area and, and putting it out, and they got an overwhelmingly good response of really diverse range of economic uh, socio-economic backgrounds as a result of that. Whereas yeah. if they, you know, and I think they even like putting them up in like job centers and things like that. You just don't see that with startup jobs or, or jobs in tech no. or you know jobs in sales and marketing and stuff. Like that. You just don't see that. It's all like you know other types of jobs. So. I think that that's that's part of the way of solving it. I, I assume. Yeah. I know it's um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. I guess, but um, I just realised the time. We've got ten minutes, so <laughs> so I told that's you. Lovely. I warned you. We would we would waffle on about all different kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's how we uh, that's how I like to do it. I hope it's been all right for you. <laughs> yeah, lots of leafy leafy lanes. Yeah, well, that's that's part of it. I mean, this you know goes back to what I said about 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 um, communication. You know, I, I, one of the reasons why I love doing this is getting to meet awesome people like you, but also just exploring things. And I think the art of conversation is is very much a, a dying dying skill, a dying art, and one that I think people need to do more of because it's amazing. You know, the different. Like I've learned a lot speaking to you, and you know, maybe I've imparted some form of uh, my twisted wisdom on you. I don't know, but and then people listening, you know, might. Uh, you know, be inspired some different ideas, and yeah, I don't know. I, I'm waffling again. I just love, I love talking. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, look, what the the last bit of structure that I that I offer in this entire conversation, <laughs> um, it, right at the beginning, right at the end, is um, is maybe some some words of wisdom that you might want to impart on anyone following your 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 path in terms of becoming a founder you've had an incredible journey you're doing incredible things we didn't even touch on some other questions i wanted to ask about your business in, in a more fundamental way like you know the tech side of your business and, and the things you're doing there so we'll definitely have to book a part two in future to delve into that in a bit more detail but um if you're if you're not sick of me obviously by that point um but yeah that journey has been an incredible one you've you've like you said you've faced a lot of um uh, a lot of, uh, of roadblocks and ups and downs through COVID from, you know, our solid investors and I assume a, a shit ton of other stuff in between. So, you know, what are some lessons you've learned that maybe you can throw out there that listeners and watchers might be able to learn from and, and avoid maybe some of those 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 roadblocks? Um, <clears throat> so I ought to automatically go to the positive. So um, the first place I would start is uh, don't go into nursing, don't go into tech shop. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't do it. <laughs> Stay at home, close the door. Thanks, thanks <laughs> Everything <time>. will be okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Um, no, so I, I think... Like short of the dead, just go to the pub, lock the door and wait for it all to blow over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I think really so much commitment is needed when you are building any business. Mm. And it re just going back to the, you know, the conversation we've just had around uh, equality and et, et, et cetera, is that it's really privileged to be able to take a step and to build something that you are passionate about and I know it sounds sounds cheesy mm. but something that because because that's what we're talking about with a lot of the startups we're not talking about your traditional labor jobs like oh setting up a plastering company or you know a building business or an accountant so we're talking about solving a problem about some uh, make, building a solution to a problem that you've either faced yourself or that you think can have real uh, social, economical, or environmental impact. That that's mm -hmm. how I get tech and the, the startup scene in tech. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're changing the status quo of things, not necessarily for the better in some cases, but def definitely in, <laughs> in 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 my case. So I think um, making sure that you um, are fully aware of what's required of you as a startup founder, mm -hmm. and all the advice that I will give to to businesses based around a typical nine to five <laughs> goes goes out the window when it comes to building a startup mm. um so i think just being aware of that in the beginning is something to bear in mind that it will impact you mentally physically uh f definitely financially socially mm. the uh, impact that it has on relationships and again i'm really privileged that i have a, a husband that is super supportive and lets me crack on and build my empire and supplies me with lots of tea in the, in the meantime <laughs> whilst I'm trying trying to do that but I think in 
in terms of tips, my, the biggest tip would be to seek out support from mm -hmm. your business uh, environment, economy, whatever you want to, to call it in your area. There mm -hmm. will be government support. Uh, sometimes it's not always the best, but it's a good, really good place to start if, if you knew in terms of finding what other supports out there. There's lots of great accelerators out there, mm -hmm. uh, NatWest. Um, part of me thinks I I've wasted quite a bit of time with some of that support because it wasn't tech specific. Right. Um, so a lot of the advice, like government stuff that they advise you on is based around traditional uh, skills and, and setting up traditional type businesses. Yeah. yeah. And the innovation piece is missing. And mm. I feel like I wasted quite a lot of time in, on that. But then when I reflect back, I learned a lot around the fundamentals and, and basics of, of business. Mm. So I think seeking out support and asking for help when you need it or asking people if they don't know who can they recommend you to for support and I think building your network is really really important mm, yeah. um, because actually all that support that you need will you know seek out people that have been there done it wore the t-shirt mm. um, it's got holes in it because they've had it that long like you know that yeah. those type yeah. of people that can can really help you and I think finally like my tips would be those fundamentals that I spoke about in the beginning of good nutrition, exercise, sleep are really key because mm. if you are not, if you burn out, then that's the end of your business journey. Mm. Um, or actually, if 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 you are burning out, you are not being productive. Mm. Um, so I think taking regular breaks, it, it sounds counterintuitive, but being kind to yourself, taking regular breaks, looking after yourself will actually probably bring success sooner than if mm. you go hell for leather. Um, yeah. And I think give yourself a great deal of flexibility. So, like, I don't know, on, on Friday I had a golf day, but then on Saturday I was I worked all day on Saturday. So mm. knowing that, you know, it's not, it's not a nine-to-five mm. um, Monday to Friday type job and giving yourself flexibility, but giving yourself downtime when you need it. Mm. Um, and and that's the that's the perks of having your own business and building a startup in the beginning mm. is being able to to flex some of those things so that you the money might not be there you might not be making any money but if you can give yourself flexibility if you can give yourself other perks then um, that's good like do I do go networking and get you dinner <laughs> from, <laughs> from, from, from nice from nice venues yeah yeah <laughs> I'm like I'm a startup. I'm like, oh, can I take this for a sandwich for my lunch tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. Just a fill your handbag full of the, yeah. the, the stuff from the, the buffet. Just like Hand, yeah. Handbag, you mean my giant fat pack. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's like the whole table. So I think, yeah, seek support, build, build your net, network mm -hmm. and take time to look after yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, all the advice that I give to businesses around good work doesn't exist when you start your own business. So you can't do that. You can't like prioritize your workload you have to learn the skills um, and train yourself as you go along and mm. you know wear seven hats in a business so all those things don't apply to yeah. startup founders uh so you have to look after yourself to be able to continue on that and, and only only the individual will know essentially what's best for them and how they they yeah. structure themselves and so on so you can't yeah exactly you can't be specific there like, no you know. and listen yeah. listen to your body because i think as mm. as we've gone on it's things we we've forgotten to do if you're getting niggles if you're getting headaches if you've got you know if your body's telling you something like listen to those mm. uh, it goes back to my you know the purpose of my business is all about prevention yeah and you know prevent yourself from burning out by taking a step back taking mm. a day off from your startup is not gonna you know you're not going to fail in the grand scheme of things mm. so it's about kind of being real about it all yeah all there's some great advice no there's some really good advice i always equate what you were mentioning there similar to like uh, going to the gym so like you know if you're going there with the purpose of you know a specific goal like 
you know, getting bulky or whatever it might be, maybe you want to enter into a race. You can't just train seven days a week. You need rest periods. You yeah. need time for your body to repair. You need, you know, and, and in fact, anyone in, in, and you may well know this as well, anyone who knows anything about the body will know that um, it actually, you get better results with, with, with prioritizing rest just as you would do working out like you know and diet and all these other things so it's it's just yeah you're, you're working towards a goal you need to regularly take a step back i think that's really good advice yeah, yeah really good advice well look thank you so much for jumping on i'm sorry we didn't get to talk about so many other things i wanted to ask you about um <laughs> but yeah like i said a good a good reason to, to do this again if you're up for it um at some yeah, point definitely. in the future um uh yeah that's that's it really we're done we will wrap up i'll let you carry on with your day you'll be free of me now but um you'll be glad to know but uh, yeah i really appreciate you jumping on is there anything you um that you want to put out there like you know where where people can come find you like uh check, check out the business uh yeah it's, the floor is yours ah excellent so you can uh find me on linkedin mainly that's where i uh, hang out so my handle i think it's called is in-house health one uh, that is my personal profile, but that's that's fine. It's in House Health One. Uh, you'll find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the places. It's in House Health One. See, I learned something that yeah, yeah. the same handles <laughs> as a business owner. Um, and you can check out the website inhousehealth.co.uk. And on there, I have a great um, tool that you can use to embed into your business called the Well Wellbeing Map Meta Action Plan. And that's the first step in helping to embed all those um those well-being conversations into your culture into your one-to-one -one performance reviews it's a free tool so oh, that's check great. It and uh, and download it and I'll, I'll share with you the um what's called qr code and you can put it up with the the bomb from this podcast yeah, brilliant. And, and i'll include the link to your linkedin and the website in the description of this as well so people can click there and i see yeah. and find it but um Wonderful. Well, look, thank you again so much. I know you're very, very busy. So really appreciate you taking the time with me. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your week. And hopefully we'll catch up again soon. Yeah. No, thanks. It was a, a pleasure chatting. There's some really good, good questions there and very windily feelings. <laughs> yeah, good. That's the way I like it. That's a yeah. good, good conversation should be, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. And uh, yeah, yeah, we'll take care and speak soon. You too. Bye. Thank you for watching and or listening. Please like, subscribe and join the conversation in the comments below.